and his great love was studying Buddhist texts. He was very well read. He was actually a commoner. He came from a very small town and, and was known as a commoner, but he actually was literate and could read. And so he very much enjoyed reading Buddhist texts. And at the age of 19, um, he briefly abandoned his path of becoming a monk. He started to become disillusioned. Um, one tale says he read the Lotus Sutra, and in the way I would say, he didn't really understand what, I, I don't know if this is it, what everyone says, and began to become a bit disillusioned with Buddhism. Um, but he was a very afraid to go back home. He did not want to shame his parents. So instead, he traveled around the country, I don't know if his parents still thought he was a monk, <laughs> I did not say, but he traveled around the country studying literature, studying poetry, and just meeting as many villagers and commoners as he can. And one of the things I noticed from the research is that regular, illiterate, common people at the time really responded well to him. They just really felt like they could speak to him despite the fact that he was literate and, and, and was so knowledgeable. So there are a few years within there where that's what he did, studying the Buddhist text. And he decided that he wanted to come back. So he did. Um, he decided, and so he went from one temple to the other initially, and then at the age of 23, he returned to Soyuji, which was that original temple in his actual hometown. And so he went back. Uh, and then he soon after, about 10 years later, became the abbot of this temple. But unfortunately, the temple was in complete disrepair. Everyone had left the temple. Um, there had been bandits that had come in and stolen the furnishings. And it was just in a complete state of disrepair. But he chose to stay. He stayed there by himself and had people come to visit him. And within this time, many of the people that were visiting him were not other monastics. They were lay people. Many of the same commoners and illiterate people were coming. And a lot of children were coming to him. So he began teaching calligraphy to the children that were coming. So you can imagine just this very warm-hearted, easy to talk to um, monk. It, 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 it just seems like he would have just been so easy and, and fresh. And again, so he was teaching calligraphy to local, local youth. He was practicing his meditation, and people were coming to him for teaching. And it was around this time that he actually adopted the name Haiku, and I thought that was his family name, and I realized it was not. He actually adopted that name, which means roughly translated concealed in white which he said reminded him of the atmosphere and the environment around the temple where he was. And he reports in, in an autobiography that has been translated into English. Can you remember the name, Don? It, it'll come to me. But there, there's actually an autobiography he wrote that was translated into English about 10 or 12 years ago. I cannot remember the name, but hopefully it'll come to me. <laughs> I don't think about it, don't come. And he says in this autobiography that at 42 years old is when he realized his final enlightenment. He says he was reading the Lotus Sutra when he heard a cricket in the garden, and suddenly the last of his doubts resolved, and he wailed and wept. And it was very interesting how that same sutra that first somewhat disillusioned him and made him think, I don't know about this, is what ended up making him feel that he was enlightened. Um, Right after this time in his 40s was when he became extremely well known. Um, he became a very popular Zen master. People were seeking him out. Um, people were asking him to come to the big cities and to teach and to lecture um, and were very excited on how he lectured about Zen Buddhism. And it says thanks to his upbringing as a commoner and his many travels, he was very able to relate to the rural population, with, which up until then, Zen Buddhism they knew of through traditions or you know verbal accounts or what have you, but being illiterate, it, they didn't really have a lot of information. So he was very good at bringing this to everyone. And it said quite many of the commoners began to refer to him as their spiritual father. <clears throat> so very much a leader in the Zen Buddhist movement, especially in these small rural areas. 
And in fact, he so enjoyed working with the common people. He was offered many times to serve in great monasteries. They say that he had several opportunities to work in great monasteries in some of the biggest cities of Japan, and he continued to turn them down, which I wish Master Jiru was here so he could hear that. <laughs> <laughs> he decided to stay in the small environment, which <laughs> hopefully Master Ji will continue to do for the rest of his life as well. Um, and most of his instruction to the common people, he decided the focus needed to be living a moral and an ethical life. He, he really felt it. And it reminds me quite a bit of the Buddha, how we learned how the Buddha knew his audience and knew um, what to teach based on his audience, based on the level of his audience. And it sounds like that this man was very similar. So he focused speaking to the commoners on how to maintain your ethics, on how to be moral, and how to be good to each other. And he, they say he drew many of his elements from Confucianism, which is similar. Ancient Japanese tradition, as well as the traditional Zen Buddhist teachings. And he was also a very popular Zen lecturer, as I said. He was asked to travel all over the country to speak on Zen and teach. And this was mostly in his 40s and 50s. And then later in his life, towards the end of his 50s, beginning of the 60s, um, he became abbot of a temple, um, Ryu Taguji. And today it's still around, and it's, high, it's a highly regarded monastery. And he's known as the founder. And I will show you a picture of this monastery. It makes me want to take a trip to Japan now. Every time I do research, I realize I have much more travels I need to do. So it's still around. And, and there's quite a bit of literature in the temple. When, when I researched about visiting, they, they have quite a bit of information on Haku in there and a lot of his works and some of his calligraphy and what have you. And it is located, to get back to the map on Japan, still relatively close to where he originally lived. It's more southern by the sea. So that's where he remained a later time in his life. And he really became known as the absolute knowledgeable one on Zen. And he actually came from um, the Renzine Zen School. There's two different kinds. It's so hard to do a talk and not to get into too much detail on all the different outlets. But basically, this, this form of Zen school is the emphasis on the Kensho experience, which is seeing the, the true nature and the use of Cohen study. Has everyone heard about Cohen's? No, okay, we will we'll get to that. <laughs> and also um, using koans while you're sitting, which in Japanese is called zazen, which is actually the sitting talk. Um, he stressed zazen is the most important practice. Sitting is the most important practice. And he taught that three things are essential to zazen. Great faith, great doubt, and great resolve. The three things. He only began painting. So often when people hear of Haku and they think of what a wonderful calligrapher and painter he was, he did teach calligraphy to youth, but he didn't actually begin painting in earnest until his 60s. So quite often when, you, when anyone who has heard of him, they think, oh, he was the great painter. He didn't even begin this until his 60s, which, which is another thing I think is really wonderful about him. How in all these different phases in his life, he opens up to a different area. And he actually passed at the age of 83 in the same village where he was born. So he ended up back in his village of Hara, and that is where he passed away. So a Cohen, he's very well known for his practice of Cohen's. Cohen's were not developed by him. They were used in China quite some time earlier. Um, the Tang Dynasty, which was at 618 to 907. So they were used well, well before him. But he's known for doing a very systemized way of doing a koan practice. So what is a koan? It is a story, a small dialogue, it's a question, or it's a statement that is used in Zen to provoke that great doubt. Remember his three things he talked about. The um, great hope, the great faith, the great doubt, and the great resolve. So this Cohen that they would ask would really provoke this great doubt within you. And it would test your progress in Zen practice. And Hakuin 
believed that the deepest way to do this was through extension med extensive meditation on the common. And he said that the psychological pressure and doubt that comes when one struggles with the Cohen is meant to create that doubt and that tension that will then lead to the Great Awakening. And he called this the Great Doubt Writing. So he wanted to make sure people understood when he gave you these comments, there are supposed to be some doubt and investigation. You're not supposed to have an answer on these right away. He is known for one of the most famous Cohen's, although it has been translated incorrectly. You all may have heard, what is the sound of one hand clapping? That's an example of a Cohen. Um, he developed that, but the clapping part was not part of it. His well-known Cohen was, what is the sound of one hand? Also in Japanese, they say it's more translated, what is the voice of one hand? So, Many people who don't think they know Cohen's, when you say the what is the sound of one hand coming, oh, well, I've heard of that before. So they are kind of these paradoxical questions that you're not sure of the answer, and through sitting meditation you come up with them. But what he actually did, he, and this is where I feel like the teacher in him is coming out, how he was able to relate to the commoners, he used a five-fold classification system. So he actually classified Cohen's in degree of difficulty. And he was able to look at his students and figure out what level Cohen they needed. So he would have them, he would give them a particular Cohen. Most of them he created. He enjoyed creating his own Cohen's. And then he would give his students one to meditate. And then they would meditate. And once they believed that they had broken through, they would go back and see him, and they would need to demonstrate their insight into this colon, which I think would be very nerve-wracking, <laughs> to be honest. But, but I'm imagining this man who seemed to be such a kind-hearted, you know, giving person that it is, it probably was a little bit less. I, I, I bet that great doubt really springs up in you when, when this is going on. And if he believed, or if his teach, other teachers believed, that you would indeed attain the level of that Cohen, then another one would be assigned. And this was just a continuous, continuous process. So it's a very systematic, those of us that are teachers, it reminds me of teaching. We have a very systematic process of how we teach, and we do not move on into a higher level until we realize the level before has been mastered. So he did have a very systemized method for how to do these comments. And it says his main role was to actually create them. He very much enjoyed creating them, and he would personally select the Cohen's that his different students would receive. And again, he created the most well-known, what is the sound or voice of one hand, but it's often, if not always, incorrectly translated. And it is believed to be known universally, even with those who know little to nothing about Cohen's. And his systematization of Cohen practice, they say, brought about a major revolution in Cohen's. It really became known as a superior method of Cohen practice and really brought that to the forefront of Zen Buddhism, whereas it wasn't practiced as much. In fact, they say there was a bit of decline in this form of Zen Buddhism until he came around and then he was completely revitalizing it. Hakuin, as an artist, as I said earlier, he only seriously started doing this in his 60s. This is when he decided he wanted to take up artwork. Um, but is easily recognized as one of the most famous Zen artists. And so for the last 20 years of his life is when he did predominantly all of his artwork. And he wanted to catch Zen values in his artwork. And he liked to call them visual sermons. And I think that's really special. You know, he, it, is, it alludes to the fact that he knew not everyone was literate, so he could do through these paintings a visual sermon that someone could understand. And they were extremely popular among the lay people at the time, who at the time, art was kind of not part of their life. Art was more at this, some sort of a higher level that more noble people would, would view but he really brought this down to the masses in a, in a very humorous, as you'll see, in a very humorous and understanding way. And he says his art was meant to teach the Dharma, and it is believed by scholars that he created tens and thousands of work of art. They don't even believe they've even uncovered the surface of the amount of his art. Because of so many, you can go to quite a few museums and see his artwork. 
I was amazed. I was looking up where some of them are. As far as Israel, they have an Israeli museum that actually has some of his artwork. So <clears throat> it is somewhat easy to find a museum somewhere in the world that has them. And he said his central concern as an artist was, on, was always on expressing mind itself and dharma itself, which, to be honest, is a pretty difficult theme <laughs> because art is drawing. How do you draw these two things? <laughs> so it's interesting to me that this is what he chose as his topic for art. Um, he used a variety of ink and paint, and they say his work was very unusual for the time because it was fresh, it was free, it was very dark brush strokes, very spontaneous, where at the time the painting and artwork was very detailed and very orderly and very light brush strokes. So his was very, very different. Um, they also say it was different because he almost always, almost always, with the exception of Bodhidharma, picked very ordinary people in their regular lives. And he would do um, interesting, funny, somewhat captions to go with these because he had such a great sense of humor. Don, do you mind sharing the one that you saw, which I thought was very humorous, that you were telling me about the bridge? So there are stick figures that are drawn of people, and they're going across a very narrow bridge, and the person that's leading them is totally blind. <laughs> And did he have writing on there as well? Or was this just yes. a picture? He yes, yes, so it's usually a poem. Okay. Yes. Quite often he had writing with his painting and his artwork. And when some of the elite artists came to see him because they were hearing about him, they were very excited until they found out that a lot of his inscriptions were taken from popular songs. They were taken from advertising slogans, which he felt had a Dharma message within them. But I think that people were taken aback that he was just so common and so, you know, a member of the people. Um, so yes, it was a huge departure from Zen art at this time, which is amazing now because many people, when they think of Zen art, they immediately think of him. Um, his most well-known subject are the self-portraits, as I talked about, which all look very different. You all should go home and Google them. It's very interesting. And he painted quite a few of Bodhidharma as well. And I actually have one of the ones that is probably the most famous one that you see of Bodhidharma. And you can see these very large brush strokes that he uses. And actually, the translation what is written above, um, it was purposeful that he put that right above Bodhidharma because the translation is direct pointing at the mind of man, seeing one's nature and becoming Buddha. So this is one of his most famous ones. He, he actually painted quite a few paintings of Bodhidharma. Um, as I said, some of the world's most leading museums have paintings of his, as well as he's had major exhibits and galleries. I know you were fortunate enough when they had one in New York City. Was it the 80s? It was just a few years ago. Okay. Um, New York had an exhibit, and so, Don, you were able to go. It's just quite a wonderful thing to get to go to. So there actually are exhibits and galleries where you can see. He was also very um, well known as a writer, probably not as well known as the artist. Most of his writings were the Cohen's that he wrote to his students, which were not shared with the public. But he wrote many letters, poems, chants, essays, Dharma talks. A lot of his writings ended up in his paintings. Very few of them have been translated into English. Um, and the, probably the best known is the Song of Zazen, which I gave for all of you. Um, feel free to take that home. It's actually a very beautiful song. Um, it, it might be, would you all like to read it together? Because it's, it's actually very beautiful. For those who have decent eyes, it is very small. <laughs> there weren't, there weren't, there weren't, weren't enough. enough? Oh, I apologize. Did most people get one? Okay, for those who didn't, you're going to pretend you're the commoners who are illiterate, <laughs> and you are going to listen. So it's called Hakuin's Song of Zazen. If you don't mind reading it with me, that'd be wonderful. All beings by nature are Buddha, as ice by nature is water. Apart from water, there is no ice. 
apart from beings, no Buddha. How sad that people ignore the deer and search for truth afar. Like someone in the midst of water, crying out in thirst. Like a child of a wealthy home, wandering among the poor. Lost on dark paths of ignorance, we wander through the six worlds. From dark path to dark path. When shall we be free from birth and death? O oh, the Zazen of the Mahayana, to this the highest praise. Devotion, repentance, training, the many paramitas, all have their source in Zazen. Those who try Zazen even once, wipe away the gameless crimes. Where are all the dark paths then? The pure land itself is near. Those who hear this truth even once and listen with a grateful heart, treasuring it, revering it, gain blessings without end. Much more, those who turn about and bear witness to self-nature, self-nature that is no nature, go far beyond mere doctrine. Here, effect and cause are the same. The way is neither two nor three. With form that is no form, going and coming, we are never astray. With thought that is no thought, singing and dancing are the voice of the law. Boundless and free is the sky of samadhi, bright the full moon of wisdom. Truly, is anything missing now? Nirvana is right here before our eyes. This very place is the lotus land. This very body, the Buddha. Really beautiful songs that he wrote. So that one is his most famous one that was translated into English. There are some tales about Hakuin. And I say tales because when I was doing the research on them, they say they're not they don't know if they're necessarily true, but they were circulating a lot at the time, so they are definitely known as tales. The first one is, it occurred when he first decided to become a monastic. He was eight years old, and he heard a fire and brimstone sermon on the torments of the hell realm, and he became terrified. And he was obsessed with this idea of the hell realm and how horrifying that would be, and really wanted to figure out how he could avoid it. And that he believed that at the age of 13, that is the reason why he initially decided to become a Buddhist priest, to avoid this hell realm. Which, I, which makes me smile, because some of us may have had similar <laughs> sermons throughout our life, <laughs> depending on our backgrounds. Um, another tale about him is that the winter he re was able to return back to his original temple. Um, Mount Fuji erupted with force, and there were great earthquakes, and all the other monks fled the, ta the temple, but he was determined to remain in the Zendo, sitting in Zazen. And he said that he told himself that if he had realized enlightenment, the Buddhas would protect him. So while everyone else in the village is leaving, he sat for hours and hours and days absorbed in Zazen as he was witnessing earthquakes around him, which is another tale of him. Probably the most famous tale that I have heard of, that I know quite a few of you have as well, we actually talked about it in one of our trainings, is the Is That So story. I think, Ryan, you may have brought this up at one of our teacher trainings. Um, basically, there was an unmarried girl who lived near Haikun's temple, and she was found to be pregnant. Her outraged parents demanded to know the father of the baby, and the girl wanted to protect the father, who was a young boy at the time. So she accused Hakuin, who at this time was a very old man, and she accused him of seducing her. So when the baby was born, the parents confronted Hakuin, and they demanded that he took care of the child. And he responded with three words, is that so? He actually took care of the baby for several months. Then the embarrassed girl was tormented about this, and finally told her father, that it was not Hakuin, it was actually the young man in the village. And the girl's parents went back to Hakuin with complete shame and sorrow and asked to have the baby back. And at that point, he gave the baby back and said three words, is that so? I've all known the very um, story as well. 
And another not so well story, but um, apparently this is a very well known story in Japan, whereas he is at So We Hear More Here. It's um, the Gates of Heaven story. And apparently there was a great samurai who went to visit Hakuin, and he sought after him because he wanted to know the question, is there really a heaven and a hell? And Hakuin said, who are you? To where the samurai answered, I'm Nobushige, I'm a great samurai. And Hakuin replied, you? And snorted and said, what lord would employ you? You look like a beggar. Nobushige was furious, began to draw his sword, at which point Hakuin said, here open the gates of hell. The samurai then took the point, sheathed his sword, and bowed to him, at which point Hakuin said, here open the gates of heaven. Show a very beautiful example. Real, really wonderful, interesting man. So how can we learn from Hakuin's example? I like to go back to that to figure out how can we take what we know about him in our daily life one of the obvious ones I think of is how many different mediums he employed with his lifetime, with the writing, with the artwork, with the tales, with the koans. I think that's such an important thing. And the idea of you're not too old for this. I was speaking to one of my great friends of how um, I'm in my 40s and some of my friends are, and I will often hear them say, well, I would love to take that up, but I'm already and, and the idea of this man who became a prolific artist when he was in his 60s. There was no concept of this is the age where you do this and this time has gone by. So the multiple mediums idea of bringing the joy and the mindfulness in your own life. Um, I, I think the idea of how he worked and taught everyone. It reminds me very much of those of us who were born in Christianity, the idea of who Jesus actually was. How he would work with everyone, the children, the beggars, the poor, and Hakuin reminds me very much of that. How he was able to work and teach all people, not just people of a certain um, stature. Um, the focus on moral development and ethics, I say, cannot be talked about enough. I think it's wonderful to read and, and study and meditate, but our daily lives and how we conduct ourselves ethically every day, I think it's a huge huge point of our own um, spiritual development, and also the importance of sitting in meditation, how he says, how if you sit one time, you will see the great value of that, and how important meditation really is. Any questions? No? Thank you all so much for listening. I hope it gets cooler. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.